Um, so let me introduce a couple simplifications because um, the whole three-dimensional derivation, it's too complicated. I don't want to do it. So I'm going to uh, simplify some things to make sure I can actually go through the derivation without getting stuck. Um, I guess uh, let me write down the very first simplifying step that I'm going to do. So um, question? Because I saw hand. Uh, OK. So the very first simplifying step, where's my purple pen? Oh. <laughs> the very first simplifying step I'm going to make is this is what I'm going to say. So to generate this wave, to generate this wave, we do have to have a charge somewhere. So there is a charge somewhere in space. And this charge, um, from what you know, it actually has to be moving up and down. It has to be accelerating up and down um, in a sort of oscillatory way. And this is the simplifying step I am going to make. I'm not going to say that um, I'm anywhere near the charge. So I'm not going to have to deal with a time-varying charge distribution. In fact, I'm going to be very, very far away from charge, way over here, where there's no charge, there's no current. Now, there is this charge here, and it's moving up and down, can be looked at as current. But this is one of the benefits of dealing with this differential form of Maxwell's equation. These are all locally specified quantities. This is a, a quantity that I calculate at a particular point in space locally. If I can say that at this point in space, there is no charge, then I can make charge density go to 0. If I can say that at this point in space, there is no current, I can say that the I can make current to go to zero. Yeah? That makes sense to everyone? Yeah. So uh, this is not a step that I would have done before, because before that would have resulted in something boring. Because So let me write it down. Um, so I'm going to looking at, I'm looking at in a region of space with the density equal to 0 and current density equal to 0. If I do that, then these equations become the divergence of the electric field is 0 because in the particular location I'm looking, there's no charge. The divergence of magnetic field was always 0. And um, the curl of magnetic field now is a little bit simpler. It, uh, the first term is 0, but I'm not, well, I have to have electric field. If I say electric field is also 0, then that means I'm very, very far away from any charge. Nothing's actually happening. So I'm just going to have the, the electric field term. So epsilon, do I want? No, I want mu naught first. Mu naught, epsilon naught, and the uh, time derivative of the electric field. Oh, I think I've been a little bit sloppy. Um, let me correct my sloppiness from earlier. Um, I should have said that this is a partial derivative with respect to time. And what it really means is that, um, so for this variation, I'm only uh, concerned with uh, how electric field is changing as a function of time. Now, if there's something else that's changing, like a position of charge, then I'm going to ignore that kind of time dependence. All I'm looking for is the explicit time dependence. Um, so with the correction, this should actually be the time derivative, partial derivative in time. It's a fine correction. It's not something that we would have paid all that much attention to in the first place. <laughs> Um, all right, so the curl of electric field looks like the time derivative minus time derivative of the magnetic field. So this is the simplified Maxwell's equation in, I guess, actual vacuum, where there's no charge, there's no nothing. Um, and you know, before I wouldn't have done this, because before, even the third term would have been 0, 
And it would have been just so easy, so much easier to say, well, everything is zero. This is all, you know, B is zero, so this is zero. <laughs> um, but once we have these two terms, they can play off of each other and give us something that's uh, non-trivial and meaningful. So, uh, so this is the very first simplification I'm doing. That just to say um, that whatever oscillating charge that I have, whatever oscillating charge is relatively far away so that um, at this point in space where I'm analyzing Maxwell's equations, I can say my charge density is zero at this point in space. Let me make a um, couple more simplifications. So it comes down to I don't really want to deal with the whole three-dimensional thing because um, that requires me to have remembered the triple product and bunch of stuff that I frankly uh, forget. Unless I review it, I'm not going to remember it. So I just want to deal with as few dimensions as possible. So let's see. What can I say? Mm. I think, let me set up my coordinate system first. So I guess I'll keep it to that system here. Uh, let's say my x direction goes this way. And my y direction goes this way. And my z direction goes this way. x, y, z, yeah. All right, so I do want to look at a charge that's potentially moving up and down. Or I do want to consider something that's physically real that's producing wave. But let me say I'm going to only deal with um, what's called a plane wave. So what's called a plane wave. It's a, um, it's a wave where the wave front looks like a plane. So not airplane, but you know, geometric plane. <laughs> so uh, what would be meant by wave front is, so you know what a wave looks like, right? Uh, I don't have a good thing to illustrate wave with. So uh, let me do it with this one. So you know what, roughly speaking, wave looks like. I'm not, um, so I'm talking to people who have a, idea of shape of wave. So you know, if you have something that's a periodic, then you can look at something like this, right? And wave plane would be a plane of point of a particular point on the wave. So uh, like that peak here, that would be a point that you can use to define wave front. And so you know, so this is a, a one dimensional wave. So it really has only a one point. But imagine this oscillating um, sort of extended. Uh, so you'll have to imagine this oscillating is extended all along the horizontal plane. Um, so imagine a series of these linkages here, 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 here. And at each of the points in space, you can identify a slinky that has some displacement. And imagine this extended in layers along the vertical direction also. So in that case, I can take a point that looks like you know, this bump and have a plane that connects all the points that have the same displacement. That would be the um, plane that's defining the wave front. And in general, it's not actually a plane. So if you have a source of wave that's maybe you know, moving in circle like this, then this would uh, generate waves that are kind of going out in spheres. But here I'm saying I'm so far away from this source that when I look at those wave fronts, I can approximate them as a plane. Mathematically, this is what it means. So if I'm dealing with a plane wave, then um, let's say I'm going to deal with electric field. So I will eventually write down something that describes electric field. If I say I'm going to be dealing with the plane waves, so this is what it means. I pick a direction of wave propagation. So here, let's say wave is going in the x direction. Then by saying plane wave, I'm saying my electric field is only a function of x. 
it's not function of y or z. Because you know, as you move along y, your electric field shouldn't change if your wave front is going to represent the plane. So what this also means is you know, the x component is a function of x alone, y component is function of x alone, plus the z component is function of x alone. All right, so this will help me simplify uh, some of these equations. You, you will see how it simplifies once I actually write them down. Write it out in the component form with the help of these expressions for divergence and curve. So let me do that. I think that's the simplest way to show why I'm making this assumption and why that helps me. Um, so take this electric field for the Gauss's law, for example. So writing out the divergence like this, or you know, it looks like a dot product. It says the x component of this plus y plus t is equal to zero. Right? But when you look at it carefully and keep this in mind, you should realize that the second and the third term immediately go to zero. Yes? Right? Oh, um, G is, um, well, it doesn't depend on Z. The Y component, it doesn't depend on Y. So these are immediately zero. And that gives you one more result, that this component is equal to zero. So my electric field has no x component that depends on x. So if I have this, well, so my x component is, if anything, it's simply going to be a constant. All right, that's fun. So I think I can actually say this. I can say, the, for the part that I really care about, the time-varying component, or you know, some component that's going to change as a function of position, and or time, I can say, well, this has nothing that's interesting to me. So I can say my electric field um, does not have a component um, that's waving, um, that's going to be uh, position or time varying. So this is actually something that, um, uh, this is a non-trivial result to right away, because this is telling us all this thing that we, I have been pointing out. What this is telling us is that what we are looking at is an example of transverse wave. Everyone here remembers the phrase transverse wave versus longitudinal wave? So, you know, it's a vocabulary word. If you forgot it, you know, go back and review it. This is what transverse and longitudinal means. This is the longitudinal wave where the oscillation of the wave is along the direction of propagation. That's a longitudinal. And transverse means the other thing, where the oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of travel. So because this is a saying that any interesting variation is not in the x component, it's in the y and z component, it tells you that whatever wave you get, it's going to be transverse wave. Okay? What was the other one you said? Longitudinal. Um, all right, so that's uh, interesting. Um, so I think one side, uh, question? If, if it was the x component, not y and z, it would be the uh, trans. The, the yeah, it, if I had a non zero x component, or you know, x component that's not constant, if this wasn't zero, then it could be a longitudinal wave. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, so having narrowed down, the components of electric field to simply y and z, I think I want to go one step further. I want to be able to say, um, well, you know, or let me say it this way. It's going to make my next calculation simpler if I had only one of those two components. So this is what it really comes down to. So, um, so far, I've tried to keep things general, other than I'm very, very far away from this oscillating charge so that, um, so that you know, I can say it's a plane wave. And with that alone, I got the fact that the x component of electric field is not really changing. 
Now, I actually have two more degrees of freedom remaining if I'm keeping things general. This charge can be oscillating up and down, or it can be up, oscillating horizontal this way. And apparently what we are getting is that if it's oscillating this way, then we are not getting any wave along this direction. So it can be oscillating up and down, or it can be oscillating this way. I am going to pick, without loss of generality, <laughs> the one particular direction. That's going to make the rest of my calculus easier. Okay? So I'll pick up and down direction. So that would be the y direction. So what I'm going to say is that the G, there's no interesting oscillation in the g component simply by my choice of uh, the source oscillating in the y direction. Okay, so, so you know, I, I will say this will be zero by choice. So I'm only going to deal with electric field which has component in the y direction. And that'll enormously help me in going through some of the um, calculus uh, um, now. So I guess, um, 